Cars, cars, cars. We Americans will buy and drive just about anything, no matter how expensive and unreliable it is, as long as it runs on gas. It's not looking good for President Biden's EV push. His interest in EV sits at just 41%. Charger number one, two, three. This one's broken. Broken and also broken. Come on, you can do it. Error detected. I'm a fan, a huge fan. There's no oil changes, no fan belts, no exhaust. It says cash only. Where would I put cash? A rapid charge just gives you just a little bit of range and it takes a long time to charge. It's gonna be expensive to insure. The Tesla insurance is far more expensive than other top automakers. Oh, and by the way, it's cold outside and those batteries don't work so, yeah. so well. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, there's that. America's EV boom goes bust. Producers begin mass layoffs. You know, a year or so ago, this would have been fake news, but it's real. And EVs were supposed to be the sustainable future of this country, but it doesn't look like that's gonna happen anymore because demand for EVs is now headed in the wrong direction. In 2022, EV sales were up 76%. And in 2023, overall demand peaked at around 9% of purchased vehicles. But that same year, auto dealers wrote a letter requesting mercy from EV mandates because sales had started dropping rapidly. And that's a problem because by 2030, two thirds of all vehicle sales must be electric cars, unlike this Audi V10. And the reason electric vehicles aren't selling and are piling up on dealers lots doesn't have to do with the usual concerns about things like range anxiety. Yes, that's part of it. But the real reason these things aren't selling is something nobody wants to talk about. So in order to understand the real reason why EV sales are bottoming out, we've got to look past the short term problems that a lot of people have with EVs because a lot of those are solvable or at least they will be in the near future. And there are long term issues with EV ownership that nobody at a dealership is going to tell you about. That's for sure. And there's really four key reasons why people are losing interest in EVs and range anxiety is this biggest one. I know Jeff Flock is. So range anxiety, that's a very common reason why people People don't want to buy an EV. My lease is up for a vehicle this year and I'm probably not going to get one. I want to be able to go places and not worry about how I'm going to get back. That would really screw up your plans and it's a huge problem, but it's only surface level because things will be done with electric vehicles to help them get the same range as today's gas vehicles. But doing that's going to be incredibly expensive. And even if it does happen, there are still other problems that will never go away. Think of this, for example, just being in a cold environment, the range of the electric vehicle drops big time because the batteries are not as efficient when it's freezing cold out. Like this here Tesla, if it gets really cold at night and it's just sitting here on the side of the street, it's gonna have to keep itself warm. This is an even bigger problem in New York City where you can't park on the street and plug in in most cases. And another problem is that even if charging is kind of rolled out everywhere, you've still got the issue of charge time. You can gas up a gas car in 10 minutes and have the maximum range, but some of these chargers, they can take hours and they'll only give you a partial range. And the idea of a road trip in one of these things, if you're going to have to stop five times to go 800 miles, you might actually be better off renting or buying something that takes gas just so you don't have the headache. Now, if you charge a Tesla like this one for about a half an hour, you can get an extra 150 miles of range. But if you stop five or six times, you're adding several hours to your overall trip. And that's why even if you've got chargers everywhere, these are all pretty much short range vehicles because the charging time takes a long time. And that's not going to change at all. The batteries that are in these things, they can only charge at a certain speed, charge them too fast and they'll explode like those exploding e-bikes you see on the internet. And that means even if you shell out a small fortune for an electric Mercedes Benz, it very well may be state of the art today, but in a world where EVs have taken over the roads of America, today's EVs, even if they come from in here, will be totally obsolete and you won't be seeing any of them. And then people think that they were doing something good for the environment and they come to the realization that giving up the high carbon lifestyle is not as easy as people thought, even though John Kerry and Al Gore tell us this is what we have to do to save the planet, but it's really increasing. All right, so according to Mr. Petroleum, who they had as a contributor on Fox News, EVs are not actually saving the world because the power sources that power your EV when it's charging are just as dirty as the gas coming out of people's tailpipes. New York City's got an EV mandate. And look at this, a lot of New York City's power comes from oil and fuel power sources. It's really a redistribution of pollution from your tailpipe 
to wherever the power source is. That's what it is. But that's not the only problem. The lithium ion batteries in these things can't be made without human suffering. The components in them are dangerous to obtain and the people mining them suffer many different health hazards. And humanitarians wonder how an EV revolution is going to take place without an increase in people being put in danger to make the batteries for those cars. And what that means is an equitable world full of EVs that everybody wants. Today's electric vehicles will have no part in that future because of where the batteries come from. And just like owning this beautiful Bentley is going to be a financial nightmare for the purchaser, electric vehicles have tons of hidden costs that the purchasers really aren't thinking about when they get them. What's it cost to replace the wiper blade? I don't know the part prices yet. Um, <laughs> Where do you buy that wiper blade? Test the service center. Service center? Yeah. I can't get it at AutoZone? Not yet, at least. <laughs> Not that I know of. We spoke with more than a few Tesla owners, and by and large, they love their cars. So much so, a lot of them might not realize how much it's actually costing them. The Tesla insurance is far more expensive than other top automakers. It's going to be expensive to insure. Okay, so as a non-EV owner, I had no idea that the insurance rates for these things were so much higher. If you crash your Cybertruck, they're going to need a new body panel for this thing. And I guess even though owning one means you no longer have to pay for things like oil changes or other stuff like that. The insurance cost, even on a basic Tesla, is just so much more than most people are expecting which should factor into people's purchasing decisions. In fact, according to MarketWatch, it's 50% more expensive to insure a Tesla than a comparably equipped gasoline alternative. But there's another cost associated with these that people also don't think of. While some garages will fix your EV, a lot won't or can't. Cook says some of the big insurance companies won't even write policies for cars like Tesla. Basically, a luxury car that is very easy to total because of the cost to fix one. So the real issue here is that these things are so complex and so full of computers that if anything goes wrong, you either need somebody who really knows what they're doing to fix it, or you have to throw the whole thing out, like you would your phone if it shatters and is broken. That's also part of the reason why a used electric vehicle will depreciate in value so quickly. Unless, of course, it's a used Cybertruck. And just imagine the repair nightmare. Any kind of small accident is going to be on this. Like, look at the headlight here. That is so awesome, but it's this one long strip along the front of the vehicle. It has sweet-looking mechanical triangular mirrors that pop out. Little camera right there. It's probably recording us right now. But a rear end collision, that's so common in New York. That could total one of these. Look at this, a Rivian owner reported a $42,000 repair bill after a minor rear end collision. And then the other problem is if you're a mechanic and you're working on one of these, now you're working with high voltage. That's not the case if you want to fix a gasoline powered car. One mistake with a Tesla, that could really be a bad health decision. And that's a risk that not everybody wants to take. You need specialized equipment to fix these things. And specialized training, which also jacks up the cost of repairs. On top of that, these things are also a high risk to first responders at the scene of an accident. Because again, you've got this massive battery which could discharge electricity and really hurt somebody. And that's part of the reason insurance policies on these can be such a nightmare. Your insurance company's goal is to make money collecting premiums, not paying them out when stuff goes wrong. Which explains why they're such a joy to deal with. I'm not sure I'd let my son drive a Tesla. I mean, he's a great driver. I love him to death. But even a rinky-dink accident in a high school parking lot, you're talking a lot of money to get that replaced. Yeah, I think a Tesla is probably a bad car for a teenager. But another thing people don't think about is the weight of these vehicles actually causes the tires to wear out faster. We're talking 20% more tire wear on average. But that's not even the biggest reason why people are struggling to make the case that buying these is a good idea at all. So this is the first big problem with today's EVs. There might be a charger here on this side of the road, but it can only charge two vehicles. There are no chargers anywhere else on the street. And charging's not just a problem here in New York, it's a problem everywhere. Charger number one, two, three. We visited 30 DC fast charging locations. There was just one little problem. This one's broken. Broken and also broken. Wow, over 40% of the chargers in this video had problems. And that means if you're here and you're at this charger, there is almost a 50-50 shot that it isn't gonna work. But when's the last time you went to a gas station and 50% of the pumps were not working? EV charging is basically a disaster if it's not being done at your house. And that's a problem in many places, but specifically here in New York, where we've got an EV mandate that goes into effect in 2030, 
30. And let's say you live up here in this little apartment and you want to buy an EV. Where are you going to charge it? Where's your driveway? Where's your charger? Even these fancy new condos right here, no way to charge because there's no driveway and no charger out on the street. And New York doesn't really have plans to roll out curbside charging at every curb, which means once you buy an EV here, it's gonna go dead. Unless you're this lucky guy or this lucky guy right here. Luckily, this car isn't parked blocking all of the chargers. And if the most reliable place to charge an EV is inside your home, not out there where you might wanna drive it, how are they not short range vehicles, really? I inspected 126 charging stalls. 27% of those stalls were just flat out of order. That is, they had a sign or an error that said charger unavailable, out of service. EVgo. So I think the issue here is that everything else we plug in and charge, like our phone, isn't gonna be plugged in, like a car over here potentially, and throw some sort of error saying it's not able to charge itself. But apparently that's common. Imagine having a dead battery and you find one of these things and you think it's your lifeline and then it fails on you. Public charging is essentially the curse of EV ownership. <laughs> $150 ticket, sir. Okay, because... I don't understand, man. We're not parking, sir. Nobody over there. $150 ticket. It's $150? Electric, electric car charger. You understand street, it's closed. Why are you closed? Yes. Not fully closed. You white closed. No, no, TOT. So if you park here like this van, and you're not using the charger, you get a ticket. This actually says that even an EV that's parked here can't be parked here if it's not plugged in and actively charging. And this inconvenience, like we're witnessing right now, that's just an unnecessary burden of ownership that you don't have if you have a regular car like the van that's parked here. The other problem is that when one of these chargers breaks, they gotta send somebody who knows what they're doing to come out here and fix it. And the more chargers there are, the more techs there need to be, and that's gonna get very expensive. And you could bet that if people want better service, more reliable charging networks, you're gonna need more people to maintain them, and that's gonna jack up the price to charge your car. Nearly 10% of the stalls visited had payment issues. It says cash only. Where would I put cash? Yes, there were specifically repeated credit card problems. Why are you beeping at me? Try another. Every single one of these problems seems so basic and rudimentary that they should be fixed. Payment? Come on, this is America. You got problems taking a credit card? These particular ones right here use an app that you have to download, and there's no way to swipe a card on these, so I guess that problem's eliminated. But this just goes back to the idea that trying to use one of these in an emergency situation might be a bad idea and might not work out the way that it needs to. Even if the payment works, error detected. This may be the most frustrating one of all, when the car and the charger don't connect to each other. When you plug the charger into the car, the two have to talk to each other and send information about So the other problem here is that plugging in your car ain't like plugging in your phone. When you plug in your phone, it's like plugging in an air conditioner. It just sucks out the amount of power that it needs and that's that. But here, this box has to communicate specifically with the car to make sure that everything is hunky-dory. You can see on the port here, there's all the different error codes that can flash, everything from red to green. It's almost like they expect you to have compatibility issues. And Tesla's very smart. They built their own charging network, so their cars always speak correctly the same language as their chargers. So they don't have these kinds of problems, but everything else, these open source, open port type deals, what a mess. All of this is so much more complicated than a gas pump. And critics say there's actually a living example right now of the disaster that awaits America if the country goes all EV. And we're gonna go see it. Hertz Renicar. They were gonna go all in on EVs to revitalize their brand and give it a nice charge, but it hasn't been working. And now they're actually being forced to go back to relying on mostly gas-powered vehicles. And if you've been watching this video and paying attention, you already know why. Hertz, a few months out of bankruptcy, uh, says it's gonna order 100,000 Tesla Model 3s. But it seems the move to go all in on Tesla has only made the world's richest man richer. The deal worked out pretty good for Tesla. Their stock went up. Hertz's stock, it went up too. But then when it turned out customers weren't really interested in renting electric cars, their stock went down. Hertz says the investment in EVs hurt them financially. And critics say that could happen to the country if EV mandates become a thing. Despite an investment of at least $2.5 billion, the expected demand from corporate and private customers has not materialized. Demand that did arise tended to come from customers who were already Tesla or EV owners. 
What has worked? So what went wrong? Well, pretty much everything. Hertz invested $2.5 billion in all of this EV stuff, but that didn't really change consumer preferences in any way. People still wanted to rent gasoline cars. And what do you think people want when they rent a car? They want a convenient, familiar experience. And they certainly don't want to have to deal with something running out of juice and not knowing how to get more in it, especially if it's a vacation or a road trip with the family. And here's another question. What if you rent an EV, but the apartment, hotel, or Airbnb you're at doesn't have charging infrastructure? Then what are you going to do if you park on the street? It's not like you can run a cord from your window. Look at this. We got a little EV right here from the parks department. Those make sense because the city has the infrastructure set up to charge them. And if the only people brave enough to rent an EV are the people who own them already, what Hertz effectively did was limit their customer base to around 1% of drivers in the country. And what that could mean is if EVs are mandated, society could undergo profound changes. What do you think about EV ownership? Is it a good idea? Are you willing to come here and rent a Tesla and try it out? I think if Hertz gets the Cybertruck in, people will try it out, that's for sure. Let me know what you think. Thanks for watching. I'll see you in the next video.